Welcome to In the Picture, portraying the artist. The main theme is the representation of artists in the 19th century, by themselves and by their friends. It's so relevant today because we all have both a private self and a public existence, a daily creation of some sort of face to the world. It may be fiction, but however we present ourselves carries its own truth about how we hope to be seen and known. This section has the theme of the image of the artist. Is this public face something that artists consciously construct or reveal? And what do these paintings show about how their artist friends thought about them? What I'm passionate about is the modern portrait. I would like to do portraits which would look like apparitions to people a century later. Sir John Everett Millet was a very famous portraitist in England at the time he made this image. Louise Jane Jopling was a friend, and she was a successful artist too, although Millet doesn't show her that way. There's nothing to indicate her profession, and no setting at all really. No chair, no furniture, not even her hands are showing. The focus seems to be on her facial expression and her dress. The portrait was Millet's gift to Jopling's son, who was his godson. In her memoirs, she described this portrait as a collaboration between the artists, writing, We had great discussions as to what I should wear. I had at that time a dress that was universally admired. It was black with coloured flowers embroidered on it. Our subject of conversation during modelling was something that made me feel very indignant. No doubt the face is better than a sugary sweet expression. Eugène Delacroix turns his head and eyes to meet ours. His thick head of hair is silhouetted against the background. Around his neck, we see a bit of his signature scarf. Delacroix was a leading painter of the French Romantic movement, and his energetic, bold brushwork shows the movement's emphasis on raw emotion. This extended to how Delacroix constructed his public persona too, he was famous for his untamed character. In fact, Van Gogh, in one of his letters, writes about how much he admires Delacroix and quotes a line from a book which said, quote, When Delacroix paints, it's like the lion devouring his piece of flesh. In this self-portrait, and all the others in the exhibition, it's important to remember that the way that artists usually create self-portraits is by looking in a mirror, so when we see them looking at us, are they presenting themselves to us and to the world? Or are they really looking inwardly at themselves? It's an unusual pose for a self-portrait, with a raised arm to shield her eyes from the light. Therese Schwarzer holds a palette and a cluster of well-used brushes. Her scarf is boldly painted with such energised strokes. In the shadow, we see she's wearing spectacles. Schwarzer was a Dutch artist who was very well known at the time she painted this, at age 37. It was her response to an invitation to create a self-portrait for the collection of the Uffizi Gallery of Renaissance Masters in Florence, Italy. A huge honour. Does the pose seem like she's maybe picturing herself looking at those great artworks of the past, among which hers would hang? Maybe the pose was also a way for her to play with light and shadow to show off her painting skills. A critic from her own time had another theory, which reminds us of how women artists of the time were considered. He wrote, This is quite a pardonable little coquetry to show off a pretty arm, a tiny wrist, and a small, powerful hand. There must have been a chill in Van Gogh's studio. He's wearing a heavy coat and a warm hat, indoors. 
unlike most of Vincent's self-portraits, in which he used his own image to experiment with colour and style, this one shows a specific moment in time. He's in Arles, in the south of France. That white cloth on the side of his head is a bandage over his severed ear. He cut it off during an episode of Mental Breakdown, after an argument with the artist Paul Gauguin. Now, Vincent has returned from a stay in the Arles hospital. It's January. The hat surely provided comfort to his wound. His eyes and cheeks look sunken, but he seems stoic, determined. He's begun to sketch out something on the canvas that's on the easel behind him. Just to the side of his head is a Japanese print. He's pinned it to his studio wall to inspire him. The thick black outlines in the print are how he paints himself too. It's like an encouraging note to himself, to work again. We can see every movement, every stroke of Toulouse-Lautrec's hand as he captured Van Gogh's likeness in coloured chalks. They're in a Paris café. The setting implies that Vincent is a bohemian, meaning someone who spent hours in cheap bars and cafes drinking and discussing art and ideas. There seem to be two subjects in this scene, Vincent and the distinctively shaped glass on his table. It's for absinthe, a strong drink that became very popular in late 19th century Paris, especially amongst the bohemians. In a letter, Vincent sadly admits that by the time he left the city, he was, quote, almost an alcoholic. We see him in profile, as if unaware of being captured momentarily, like in a photograph. In fact, Toulouse-Lautrec was quite interested in photographic portraits and posed for some himself. Photography was still a new medium at this time, and this new way to see themselves and others influenced many of the artists in this exhibition. Vincent, however, wasn't interested in photography. He stated that the soul wasn't in a photograph. Edgar Degas creates this portrait to look unposed, like a fleeting moment. We can almost hear the rustle of her dress as she leans forward and clasps her hands. She's Victoria Dubourg, an artist friend of Degas. There's a bouquet next to her, Degas' nod to her speciality as a painter of flowers. The composition seems like a snapshot. Degas was very interested in photography as a new art form, and we can see that here, with the chair on the left and her dress on the right seemingly cut off. However, Degas planned this composition very carefully. We know that from his many drawings for it. On the wall above her, we can just make out two framed pictures that he painted over. Maybe they distracted from Dubourg's gaze at us. It brings to mind a famous quote by Degas. He said, We were created to look at one another, weren't we? Hanging next to this portrait is another that looks casually posed. The man with his legs up on a chair. This is a portrait of the artist Pierre-Auguste Renoir by an artist friend, Frédéric Bazille. Renoir, who had little money at the time, was staying at Bazille's studio apartment in Paris. Renoir kept this painting for the rest of his life. What does it feel like to live in an ageing body? Helena Scherzbeck is 53 years old in this painting. She made self-portraits throughout her life. Behind her are paintbrushes in a red pot. The brilliant colour is across her head too, from ear to ear, linking the face she shows to the world with her tools. Scherzbeck is a national icon in Finland. After early success living abroad and then in Helsinki, she abandoned city life to live in the Finnish countryside for her health and to concentrate on her work. She produced raw and radical works like this one in those years, when she also painted her mother and other local women. 
This painting was her response to the Finnish Art Society commissioning her self-portrait. It felt like a triumph. Note the confident tilt of her chin and her raised eyebrows. She didn't usually inscribe her name on her works, but she did here. We can feel her hand at work, partially scraping her name away. She called this her tombstone inscription. The Swedish artist Mina Carlson Bredberg presents herself in a Paris studio, wearing a painter's smock. The edges of her mouth angle up a bit, a smiling expression, which is unusual in this exhibition. She's put up a cloth to diffuse the strong light coming in over her shoulder onto the canvas. The view indicates that she's in an attic. Such spaces were perfect for artists because of the plentiful light and the many flights of stairs made them relatively cheap. She's 32 years old here. At the age of 20, she had been pressured to marry a man she was observed kissing. Social custom dictated that a married woman quit her career, so she gave up painting during the next seven years. We see her here after she left her marriage, having resumed her artistic training. In Paris, there was an informal group a kind of sisterhood of Scandinavian women artists. Instead of looking out towards us, Leon Spilliart looks downwards in this self-portrait. It's a watercolour in very muted shades. The strongest colour is on the bentwood chair, whose curving form contrasts with all the squares. Many of them are mirrors, and there's a sense of infinite reflection behind him. Spilliart was a Belgian artist who focused on complex self-portraits during this period of his life. They often included ghostly apparitions, as here. He suffered from anxiety and insomnia. To calm his nerves, he would take long nighttime walks. Unlike so many of the works in this section of the exhibition, of artists at work, we get a sense of him during the night. Some of the dark squares are windows. Harsh lighting comes in from above, not natural light. As he looks at the work on his easel, his eyes are in shadow. Is he perhaps also looking inwards at his own anxious mind? Van Gogh painted this in an institution for the mentally ill in Saint-Rémy in the south of France. He went there after numerous breakdowns and stayed for a year. During that time, he usually only worked in the periods when he was feeling better. But here, we can see he's not feeling well. He shows us that in his expression, his sunken, downturned mouth and wary eyes. And in the thick and coarse brush marks, it's as if the very air around him is pressing down upon him. In a letter from the institution, Vincent wrote that he felt so fragile, thin, pale as a devil. Vincent painted this around the same time as the self-portrait. While he was in the asylum, he had with him some copies of paintings he admired. He created this after an image by the artist Delacroix, it shows the Virgin Mary mourning the dead Christ after the crucifixion. It's interesting that Vincent gives Christ reddish-coloured hair and beard. It's tempting to see this as Vincent's reference to his own suffering. Edvard Munch presents himself stripped naked, unprotected, he suffered from depression and anxiety, and this self-portrait in hell seems to say that his existence as a person and as an artist was a private hell. The colours create an atmosphere of flames and heat. The huge black form behind him, is that a threatening shadow? Smoke? The angel of death? It's up to us what each of us might find the most threatening like an undetermined shape in a nightmare. There's a red swipe of paint across Monk's neck. 
He created this after the intense breakup of a tumultuous romantic relationship. His sense of loss and anger is something that so many of us can relate to. He doesn't show himself as a helpless victim, however. He's standing upright, with his shoulders back. One of his hands seems to be leaning on some sort of surface, like a table. It's a pose that's reminiscent of an official portrait. Maybe he's showing us that he is still strong and in control. In the self-portrait, he dares us to confront his psychological hell, his demons, and by extension, ours. This very large painting has a monumental scale that we usually don't associate with Van Gogh. It seems to be Francis Bacon's monument to Vincent's work, his mastery of emotional brushwork and use of colour, and to Vincent as a person, the misunderstood genius. This painting is based on a much smaller work by Vincent. Bacon had only seen it in photographs because it was destroyed in a World War II bombing. Vincent shows himself setting off to work outdoors. He's wearing a large straw sun hat, laden down with his portable easel, box of paints and a walking stick. Bacon seems fascinated by this small figure with a huge shadow. For Vincent, it was an actual shadow to show the heat of the sun and the feeling of being burdened during his walks. For Bacon, the shadow takes on a life of its own. Bacon makes Vincent into a walking shadow. His face becomes dark smears of paint. The form on the ground merges with him, looking like a naked version of the same man. <laughs> 